What's up, Disc Golf fans? Brian Bowman here, and we're back with Disc Golf Examiner's Plastic Picasso, Episode 2. You know, I recently got a new camera, got some new lights, got a little new setup, a light box, turntable, got a lot of new toys to play with. I was coming in to record the intro for this video, and I realized we already got a ton of content in this video, so I'm just going to skip the intro. We're going to go right into the uh, interview with Mike Sully Sullivan, uh, who has commissioned a series of artist-focused discs where the artists get to do whatever they want, do a self-portrait, uh, and this is the first release in the self-portrait series, and this one is by uh, Marmoset, who you probably know because he's worked with a ton of companies, and if you don't know him, you've still probably seen a bunch of his work. So let's get right into the episode. This is Plastic Picasso, Episode 2. Sully Sullivan and Marmoset, two guys that have teamed up. Uh, Mike has actually started a whole series of artist self-portrait discs. And uh, first thing I want to ask him is, Mike, what's uh, the idea behind this? I love the idea. It seems pretty simple, but obviously you're not a disc manufacturer. You're not the artist. You're just commissioning these artists and. Uh, bringing them out to the forefront uh, with these discs. So tell me about the project you have going on and what you expect to see in the future. So I, I really value the art community in disc golf, and I was sort of thinking to myself ways in which we could uh, continue to get artists paid and recognized, and I, I hate this buzzword, but you know, build the brand for the artists themselves. Because too often the artist is almost invisible. Uh, you know, they create a beautiful stamp for an event, and, you know, people who are hardcore will know, oh, well, that's a, that's a Marmoset, that's a Mike Insko, that's a Zam. But uh, to a lot of the disc golf world, the artists themselves are invisible and their work is what speaks for them. And, and that's good in some ways. But in other ways, I, I, I sort of think, you know, I come at, I come at this from music. I, I, was a, I was a classically trained singer. And so I'd sing, you know, Mozart and I would sing Schubert. And then I would write my own songs that were not classical, and some of those were for public consumption, and some were just because I, I wanted to do it. And so much of artistic expression is about doing something for yourself. And so I said, well, how can we take that impulse and also make something that is good for the fan base and hopefully lucrative for the artist and sort of uh, keep working on normalizing the idea that people ought to be paid for their hard work and for their art in this industry. <laughs> and this is the idea I came up with. I said, you know, we're, we're going to literally have the artist tell a story about themselves. Just an open stamp. Tell me something about how you relate to art, how, what, you, what influences you in art, how you think about art, who you are as an artist. Uh, any or all of those things can be contained within this that you create, but it has to be personal. And that will help people get to know you better as an artist. It will connect your art and your style with you as a human. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, the business end of it will, will also sort of normalize the fact that artists are professionals who deserve money for their work like anybody else. Yeah, uh, amazing idea. Pay an artist, get good work. <laughs> it's, it's weird how you get what you pay for. And you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned during that uh, telling a story, and I don't think I've ever seen a stamp that tells more of a story than this thing, because I've been looking at it for two weeks, <laughs> or a, a week now, looking at it under the microscope, and every time I look at it, I see something different. There are faces in the trees, 
there's obvious faces in the trees and then there's not so obvious faces in the trees and little playground down here you got mushrooms who's this guy what is this guy doing what's his story there's a million things going on besides the main focal point which is your self-portrait side of it marmoset so uh mr marm can you break down what is going on here and uh tell us how this is a self-portrait as well because i'm guessing you don't have the plague i'm hoping you don't have the plague <laughs> right so this represents the duality of man i'm i'm the person in the center i'm the plague doctor he's got two sides to him in his right hand he's holding up a light and because he's using the light to help look for plague victims and he's using it to help so there's that aspect and in the other hand he's holding a sickle which is something that you use to harm so within the same person you have urges to help people and you've got urges to hurt people and this is kind of like the internal conflict that we all have yeah, I like that. And you clearly, with the foils, you went with these nice matte foils in like gradations of gray, white, and black. Uh, it's very black and white, but a lot of gray as well, like the in-between, the duality. I, I like that a lot. There's a lot in this stamp that uh, I don't want to throw it, that's for sure. I'm going to hang it up, probably. <laughs> I, I almost hate to hear that. I really liked it. I really like the idea of my frisbees flying through the air. Uh, but... I just want to stress that when, when an artist who's dedicated to their craft starts to design a stamp, they take a lot of different varieties or a lot of different factors into consideration. None of us just sit down and draw and then hand you the first thing we draw. Hmm. There's, I'm a member of a stamp guild that has several of the highest profile artists in the game. And I know that I know their workflows, and none of us are just making doodles and handing it off. So to Sully's point, we're putting a lot of really hard work into this, a lot of decision making, a lot of thought processes. And it's nice that you want to pay us for that because we work really hard. So with this stamp, I decided to make the character. Like his body, his body language is hinting at the internal struggle between wanting to do right or wanting to do harm. He's looking towards the light. He's got the light up in his right hand. He's looking towards that, but he's, his body is turned and walking towards doing harm. So there's, there's an internal struggle. He's looking this way, but walking that way. And I mean, these are all little decisions I made along the way. And hopefully... If you sit there and think about it long enough, you can pick up on some of them. Yeah, we played then, the, the, the we played the time lapse of, of your creation process in the beginning a little bit, and uh, you sent it to me sped up like five hundred percent. I sped it up another five hundred percent. So when you see that just flash up on the screen there, you know it's <laughs> that that took hours and hours and hours. I think you told me. Right? <laughs> The, the total number w was insane, and you really see that quality come out in there. Yeah, I, I don't know how many hours I have in it, and I don't really want to know because that, that might not be good for me. <laughs> it was a lot of hours, but they were fun hours because Mike asked us to do something that we really want to do rather than... He asked us for our creative input rather than asking us to draw something that he wanted. So. He asked us for our professional opinion about what would look good and what would work, as opposed to he wanted he hired us to depict something that he already had in his head. And that goes a long way towards getting a quality end product, in my opinion. Right. So and I one thing I wanted to ask sort of both of you as a team who has just sort of started going down this road, I feel like one, this is awesome for artists. This is how artists should be recognized. This is how things should be done. But what's the next level? Uh, because, like I said, you guys aren't disc makers. Marmoset, I've seen your, like, your recent Innova Polecat stamp. Like, that wasn't 
commissioned by Innova. You went out and did this. Sully, you're going out and creating this. You're putting the investment in. Where is the next level? Where can we go um, with artistry and disc golf beyond maybe these stamps? Like, uh, for example, like everybody's vlogging now. Obviously, I've started this to try to get into it, but where are we missing a place that we can really take it to the next level? I'll go first, if that's okay with Marm. Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> so th this is actually, this ties in a lot with how I thought about this series. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick aside. I've worked a lot of different jobs. You know, uh, most people know uh, from my run for, for the board and my service on the board of directors of the PDGA that I uh, was, up until recently, an attorney. I've, I've actually shut down my law practice uh, to go a different route. That's a, that's a separate story. But... In my in my time, I've also worked as a, uh, a canvasser for environmental and human rights uh, concerns. I've I've worked in grocery stores, uh, hot foods, and prepared foods, and you know the the up up front because as a cashier, I've worked selling cookware at Bed Bath and Beyond. I've done retail uh, in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and one of the things that you learn when you work a lot of different jobs like that, and you try to do well at them, is that People are professionals and ought to be treated as professionals, right? The, the good cashier you have at your grocery store is a professional, and, and they are do some professional deference to their skill set. Even, even if you think you could learn it, you, you don't have that skill set, and you should defer to them as a professional. It's the same with your attorney and your doctor. You know, Unless you have a good reason not to, people who do work ought to be treated as professionals who have a knowledge base that is not yours, unless you're in the same field. And I think that one of the things that is missing from disc golf art, is, is not totally missing, but we're starting to get there, is having that kind of professional deference to an artist's skill set. And I think, I hope that one of the things this series does is demonstrate what can be achieved when you have that sort of relationship. When I, when I say, Marm, you are the artist. I'm not an artist. I'm not going to micromanage your work. Uh, we're trying to build something together here, and I trust you as as the builder to build me You know what I'm asking you to do. And whether that is an open stamp like this or whether it's a commission for a tournament, uh, I, think that's, I think that's the next step is, is establishing that level of professionalism. Uh, in terms of how we approach the artists. The artists already have that professionalism. It's how we as an industry need to approach them. Definitely. That that, that makes total sense. Uh, I love that you have a very eclectic background. Uh, I, I come from food and music as well, and Marm has done some crazy things in his past. Uh, he, I saw an Ars Technica article, and he later confirmed that he, it was him where they made the seat cover uh, for an autonomous car so a human could sit in it and judge people's reactions and stuff. And uh, that's that's a huge part, I think, of the design aspect of things is that artists know how to surprise people and how to tell a story in a way that's not normal. And I think we're getting to that a lot more with our disc golf side. And uh, how many artists do you have lined up uh, for your, or what can you tell us about your series that, you know, you can break the news here or something? <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about it. So right now I've got a total of five, including Marm, uh, in the stable. The next guy up, and that, that pre-order will probably drop within the next two weeks, is uh, Justin Lago. And that's a name that people haven't heard uh, outside of maybe... Uh, the circle up here in Northern Virginia, and, and maybe if, if people have paid attention to uh, the finalists for the Hall of Fame Classic stamp, uh, which he designed one of those. Okay. And I believe he's a finalist in Infinite Stamp Wars with his Lady Luck stamp. And so what I, I wanted to bring him in because he comes to us from the tattoo world, and I think he actually he's got a good work ethic, and he's got a great eye for design, and he's got a real passion for disc golf and art. And... Um, the stamp that he's created coming up is is incredible. Uh, I posted a little bit of a preview. I saw that of uh, of sort of the final draft. It's been tweaked a little bit since then on the fan page, but uh, we're talking sort of Indian subcontinent uh, gods and mythology mixed with H.R. Geiger biomechanical cyberpunk 
and statements yeah. about <laughs> about the uh, finality of disc golf shots, uh, which I sort of appreciated as someone who gets sort of mental paralysis on the tee sometimes about how final a shot is. It sort of spoke to me, and uh, it's going to be really something something very cool. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, in order, we've got um, you know we've got Mike Insko and we've got Katie Longoria. I'm very excited about bringing her uh, into the here, and then we're going to finish out at the end of the year with John Dorn. So uh, we've got some some great artists coming up. I'm very excited. Yeah, I'd love to see the 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 you got some females in there as well. That's always yeah, good. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Marm, what what do you got yeah. uh, coming up? Because oh. you seem to be coming out with things left and right here. <laughs> Before we move on to that subject, which I'll happily tackle, um, I want to comment on Solly's choice to have tattoo artists. I think it's a really intelligent choice to have tattoo artists design discs because stamps are tattoos for discs. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you have you go to a tattoo artist so that they can use their skill to put something beautiful on your body and that tattoo represents something personal about you. It also represents something about the artist and their vision and their talent. And just like we love our bodies, we love our discs. I mean, the, this, the, the disc style that you choose to throw, the disc colors you choose to throw, the stamps that are on the disc, everything about that is a personal decision. Those are tattoos on your disc. So Sully's choice to use a tattoo artist, I mean, is brilliant. I, I will, I don't think I even need to say this out loud, but when I design my, a lot of my stamps, they are very heavily tattoo influenced. I mean, if you look at like the leprechaun stamp or things like that, I mean, that's just, it's, it's heavy tattoo influence. That's awesome. No, I, I definitely agree. And uh, so yeah, tell us what you've got coming up. Obviously there's gonna be links for everything below so that you can follow uh, this series and Marm's art as he moves forward. But tell us what you got coming up that you can share. I've been doing, uh, <laughs> since you asked, I've been doing a lot of work for companies. So I'll just hold up one or two discs here. I've been working with Innova DGU to make the Zen stamps and the, the Undead stamps. But what that really does is it helps establish their brand. And Sully already spoke about this. I'm working really hard to help them establish their brand, and I'm kind of advancing mine at the same time, but not really. So what I'm looking to do in the future is Don Freeman and I are working together to do a lot of, a lot more stamps. And that's really going to be my brand. So it'll be a lot more of the self-produced things and less work for companies. I'm not saying I'm cutting out companies, but this Polecat was my, my first self-produced project and it went over really well, even though the Polecats aren't the most popular disc. The market's out there. Yeah, and I got mine right back there. I just like, <laughs> what's that? I said I got mine right back there, right at the end of my <laughs> <laughs> So. At this point, what I really want to do is get some of my stamps onto the discs that I love the most and be doing a bunch of disc-specific stamps. That's the immediate goal. There is a whole series that I have planned with Don. The Leprechaun, he's going to be a recurring character. My Jalapeno Assassin is a recurring character. It's, I have this whole universe planned out. Like I. I literally have at least one or two full outlines for a comic book series in my head. That's and awesome. I want to see that played out on discs. And as far as I can tell, I think those are all going to be through Don Freeman. I think the only way I'm not working with him is if <laughs> one of us dies. Okay. <laughs> no, but that's a great, that, and that's a great lead in. Uh, I want to end with just something nice and simple and easy. Uh, 
imaginary hole, you don't know what it's gonna look like. What is your disc you're taking off the tee? What is it, what disc are you taking that you know, no matter what the hole is, you can have a shot? Mike, why don't you go first? Oh man. Um... Easy question, right? <laughs> Yeah, imaginary hole. What kind of hole? I mean, honestly, if, if we're just saying, I, I have no idea what this hole is going to be. Is it going to be left to right, right to left, heavily wooded, open? Um, yeah, any, any, any or all. I'm, I'm, probably, I'm probably grabbing an MVP relay um, because I, I can power up that disc really easily to get a nice, like, flat, soaring turnover on it. I can throw it on various hyzer angles to get it go dead straight or kind of pop up and then carry on a, on a smooth hyzer. Um, I feel like I can get at least to a placement if I'm, I'm playing for, for three and anything in my sort of three range uh, with that disc. Okay, okay. I like that choice. I like that choice. What about you, Marm? The bread and butter of my game is putters. I'm reaching for a putter. 90 to 95% of my shots are with putters. Um, I tend to throw a little further than most. I mean, I don't have elite power level, but getting a putter out to 300 really isn't an issue for me. Oh, so uh, there's a really good chance I'm throwing a putter. What putter? And, but if you're asking specifically which putter, see, that, that's where it gets interesting for me. I don't compete in tournaments. I just go, what I love to do is just go out and throw a disc and watch it fly. I don't care what disc it is. I don't care what plastic it is. I don't care what company made it. So basically every time I go out, I probably have new discs in the bag. I don't care about consistency. That's not why I play. So it's probably a new disc. It's probably some kind of putter. I love AVRs. I love proxies. I love pilots. I know Mark Lutz is going to love to hear me say that I love pilots. <laughs> I love anodes. Squadron. Anodes are awesome. <laughs> yeah, anodes are up there. Discraft has several good ones. APX, Magnet, Challenger. I mean, everybody makes a good putter. I see so what you're it's probably one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got this in an anode. Uh, that it, anode is what finally kicked the AVR out of my bag. <laughs> And I think for me, I'm right. probably going with a Plasma Envy or a Plasma Proxy uh, or a beat up one that's in between the two of them. But that's probably what I'm going with off the tee as well. So I like the, uh, the putter approach as well. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. I will, I will say I, I can't get a putter to 350 like Marm can. But my, my hesitation uh, when I answered was entirely because I was trying to think of whether I was going to say... Uh, my firm Electron Envy, or okay. my <laughs> so it's, it depends, uh, you know. Yeah. We can throw each other's bags if we ever meet up for a round. We'll be good. I'll do bag switch round at Moraine. That'll, that'll work out. Hey, anytime. Well, I just want to thank you guys uh, for your time tonight. Uh, obviously, there's going to be links and everything below, so you can follow these guys. Follow what they're doing, and uh, obviously like and subscribe. Is there anything you guys want to say before we head out? Just want to thank Marm. Uh, he was amazing to work with. Just a consummate professional. Uh, really a joy to uh, to help curate this. And I actually want to thank, uh, he mentioned Don. I want to thank Don Freeman. Uh, I've talked to him a lot when I was putting this together, and he's been a great resource and, and someone who's really collegial and really positive about the sport and I think has the right idea about uh, where art fits in disc golf. So thanks, Don. I will agree with that on both counts. I've been talking to Don and Marm a lot more recently and they've both been great people to work with. What about you, Marm? Anything you want to say before we head out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't be doing these discs if people weren't buying them. <laughs> so I super appreciate everybody buying them. I mean, I, I work really hard and people gush over them online. And I got to admit, it feels really good to hear that people love them. And that just makes me want to do more. So I, I super appreciate people who are buying discs. Uh, uh, some of the people buy discs that they, are, they don't even tend to throw. They just want to support me. And that, that just means the world to me. Couldn't do it without all the people who are supporting me. I super appreciate them, 
And I got to say thanks to Mike because he gave me an opportunity to do something for me instead of for just another manufacturer. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, this is Brian Bowman with Disc Golf Examiner. This was our second episode of Plastic Picasso. And until next time, keep banging those chains. Ching, ching. Oh, that's going in there. I'm leaving.